Hey, greetings, Fred and Alaska. Thanks for joining me. Uh, man, we having some some high winds and all that kind of stuff up here. It's freaking Friday. Everywhere else, it'd be a hurricane wind advisory or some crap. Um. Uh, on a somber note, uh, I wish to send uh, well wishes and prayers to Tom. Uh, Tom is the co-host of America's Creek Devil podcast with William Jebning. Um, he's currently in hospice care. Uh, prayers to him. Uh, prayers to Rick Souther over in Bangor, Maine. Um, he's dealing with some medical issues. He's a longtime supporter of the channel. Oh, and also I want to give a shout out to Miguel, a service member. Uh out of state uh from alaska and he sent me a text the other day thanking me for keeping him tethered to home so i shout out to him as well um what i want to share with you today uh it comes from ramona and paul now ramona and paul uh lifelong alaskans uh they met at an afn conference many years ago afn for those who don't know is alaskan federation of natives and Paul happened to be doing some native art stuff he was selling for his cousin at a table and she happened to buy some earrings or something. But anyway, so they hit it off. And this is like 30 years ago, you know, back when the stuff was still happening at the Diamond Center and, you know, other places, not just down at the convention center. But anyway, so, you know, they had a love for everything outdoors. And so Paul... And Ramona, after they were married, they ended up getting a plane together and getting their pilot's licenses. And so one of their th favorite things to do was to just puddle jump here and there, you know, in their, in their little, um, I believe is a Cessna. And they would just go, you know, from here to there. They're based out of Anchorage. Uh, they would fly over towards Electnagik and Bristol Bay, you know, they did the whole Togiak Platinum Tour, you know, where they're flying around out that way. And they had always been aware of the Hairy Man. Um, some of Paul's uncles had had some experiences, and so they decided, you know, about 10 years in, you know, of their, their marriage or whatnot, hey, you know, uh, let's, let's go check out, see what we could find. So they spent... The next 10 years going all over the place found a track you know things like this but never never really came across anything right because needle in a haystack you know because uh, this type of stuff is so random in nature so they had basically given up you know like oh geez we've flown everywhere we know they're out there but where you know that type of thing so you know they they would basically given up so about 10 years ago now they were just flying back towards uh, Bristol Bay area. They went to Dillingham, got fuel. They flew out to Electnagit because it was so beautiful. They had been there a few times before. And they decided, you know, we'll just go from here up to Tick Chick Lake and see about, see if they have an opening, maybe stay at the lodge up there, Tick Chick Narrows. And so as they were flying, they were going from Electnagit and just flying due north. Yeah, it kind of kind of goes off at an angle or whatever. Or it runs you know, at an angle. And so they were going due north and they were approximately between third and fourth lake and they noticed some fairly large ponds off to their right hand side. And so Paul was like, well, hey, let's see if we can land and check it out. This was going into the fall and they, they're thinking maybe we find a spot, pick some berries, you know, and just have a lunch with berries, munyuk or whatever. So they go over, they find a pond, uh, just barely big enough to land on. You know, he, he felt like, uh, he may have made a mistake being a little overzealous when he landed because he was like, yeah, I don't know if the wind's going to be right when we take off. He didn't want to get stranded there. You, you know what I mean? And have to wait for the wind to change because God only knows. I mean, you can't predict that shit. So they just, they're sitting in the plane. You know, they, they pulled up to shore or whatever. He had tied off to some brush and he had tried to pound in a stake, but there was a lot of marsh that he wasn't anticipating, right? And so they're kind of in a stuck situation until the wind changes. So they decide, well, the the marsh, the bog is, is you got to imagine like a bunch of real thick peat moss on top of water. And it's, it's kind of like a big old spongy waterbed, but some places are thinner than others, right? And with the tundra, you got all, it ebbs and up and down, up and down. You know, you got these little rises, big rises, small, it, it, it's just pot marked, right? So they're, let's, let's explore. 
you know, we gonna we have to wait for the weather anyway. Let's make the you know the best of it. And they always flew ready to camp at at a moment's notice. They find a pretty place. Um, I can't say as I blame them. And so they're, they're prepared, you know. So uh, Paul grabs his 338, his rifle. Uh, Ramona has a 44 Magnum, and you know they get on their hip boots and stuff, and they're just kind of looking around and they get away from the water's edge and into the more firm tundra and they're, they're starting to see blackberries and stuff and they weren't quite ripe and so just enjoying you know just adventure hairy men wasn't on their mind none of that stuff that it you know they had since given up their their trek for you know searching for hairy man so they get about it, it was about 200 yards from this little pond to the edge of the tree line and when they get to this tree line uh, Paul had noticed that there was a clearing just beyond this tree line, a, a nice little meadow, and he there was no water that he saw, and he assumed maybe there's you know salmon berries or some other berries ready. So let's let's trudge through here, and we'll check the berry patch, you know, a little further away. Why not? You know, I mean they're there for adventure. Why why the hell not? So they go traipsing through, and they didn't bring any marker tape. So what Paul was doing is they were walking through is he would grab a tree and break the branch. Or if there wasn't a tree, you know, branch low enough, he would find something and score the side of the tree, right? Blazing a trail. So he does this so, you know, on their back track, they can come right back to where they were without a whole lot of, you know, searching around or whatever, which, you know, they, they were pretty pretty safe with their what they were doing. So they get back into this opening and Paul's in the lead and Ramona's behind him. All of a sudden, Paul stops. He stops, gets down on one knee, and he's got the rifle pointed. Now, uh, Paul uses open sights on his 338. Uh, he, that's what he preferred. Uh, he has it for short range. He doesn't want to try to be fiddling with the scope if a bear's charging. Fair enough. <laughs> so he's down on one knee. Ramona can't really see, so she steps off to his behind his right shoulder and is looking over his shoulder in the direction he is, and she sees what he saw. And that's at the opposite side of this meadow, right inside the tree line or just outside of it. They couldn't really tell at first because it was just dark. It was just a dark kind of shape over there. That wasn't really a silhouette of a figure or nothing. It was just a dark shape, like a big dark mound. And Paul said he, his heart skipped a beat because he thought, bear, oh crap, we, we just walked up on a bear. And it looks like it's sleeping because it's not moving. And they have no visual of the head to look at the ears, muzzle, or anything to truly identify it as a bear. It's just the assumption because of its coloring. It was kind of a grizzled, dark color. And he assumed brown bear, you know, I mean, they're, they're in the wood tick chicks, you know what I mean? So, obviously, it's bear country. Big, big bear country. So, they're kind of watching to make sure they don't want to disturb this thing but the wind is blowing not in their favor so their scent is blowing right towards this bear and so paul at first was like oh crap and then he figured well no it'll it'll wind us and it'll get out of here you know no harm no foul let's let this bear wind us well he notices movement of this mound and ramona's right over his shoulder they're both just patiently watching just kind of seeing what this bear was gonna do and Paul said he, he stood up and it was just holding a rifle, waving his arms. And he said it was about 65 yards, maybe, across this meadow to the distance of where this thing was. He starts screaming, hey, bear, 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 waving his rifle. All of a sudden, this thing stands up, right? And it's coloring and the backdrop behind it. They couldn't, it blended in. So they couldn't see exactly what it was. So they assumed it was the biggest bear they've seen in a long time standing up across this meadow and Paul starts screaming louder hey bear 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 he didn't want to have to shoot this bear you know the bear isn't acting aggressive and again they don't they they assume it's a bear now he tells Ramona get get your gun out just in case god forbid you know and so she's she didn't he didn't even have to tell her that she already had it out as soon as this thing stood up now, they couldn't make out its shape because of the backdrop. It was black spruce and stuff, and they couldn't make out its exact silhouette. And so he continues, hey, bear, bear, bear. And then at one moment, it, it comes down onto all fours. 
and they still can't make it out. It, it's just something weird about the shape. So he shoulders the rifle because obviously now it, it's facing their direction. Paul said he didn't know what to do because it, it, he wanted to back out of there. He, he, he said there was something in the air that the energy wasn't right. And he felt like now is the time to let's let's get out of here, right? So he's he's whispering to Ramona, hey, start start backing up and you you follow our back trail and I'm gonna walk slowly behind you, just keeping an eye on this thing until we're clear, and then we'll you know we'll continue on and just leave this thing be. Cause again, weird shape, dark in color, assumed it was a bear. They had no confirmation of exactly what it was at this point. Now, Ramona turns around, doing what, as her husband asked, you know, and, and yeah, she's game to get the hell out of there because she felt the energy as well. From her point of view, when she turned around to start going back down the trail, she was just walking along in the trail and whispering this way, this way, because Paul's walking backwards. And he's keeping an eye and kind of glancing over his shoulder every once in a while, keeping an eye, and this thing hasn't moved. Paul said once they got about 15 feet back into the woods to where it was starting to obscure because of the brush because their trail wasn't a straight shot it was kind of weaving in and out of this brush uh once he got to where there was no visual of this thing anymore except just a, a smidge he felt a little more comfortable like there was enough distance he could turn his back and, and focus on beaten tracks right now the woods the depth of the woods between the open tundra where they landed in the pond and this meadow was roughly 45 50 yards roughly this is all guesstimation he wasn't like he had a tape measure out and was you know scoping it or whatever so he said they got about half that distance about 25 yards on their back trail and all of a sudden they hear thrashing at the trees behind them right Paul said he never jumped and turned around so quick in his life. He's back down on one knee waiting for this charging bear. And he sees big brown grizzle kind of color in between the trees. But he's, you know, he's obscured. His vision is obscured. He can't make out exactly what it is. So he pops around off to try to dissuade this charge. Uh, it works. This thing breaks off to his left, and he still can't see it. He he has no confirmation of the visual, except he knows it, it's big and it's making noise right over there, and it's moving away. Cool. All right. The bear knows what's what now. And let's let's continue on. They double timed it <laughs> once once the shot rang, and this thing veered off, you know, off to their off to their left, and now it would be back behind them on their right. They clear the tree line and they get out into the tundra uh, at least a good 75 yards and then they stop to catch their breath because you got to understand if you've never walked on tundra, throw a bunch of moss on a mattress and walk around on it for an hour. You, you know what I mean? It, it's it's tiring. You, you, the force you normally put in on hard land, you, you immediately feel that force. Well, when you're walking on tundra, some of it's absorbed. So you're put, expending extra energy to make the same motions, right? So they're catching their breath. They're looking on their back trail. Uh, Paul's keeping an eye out. Ramona's freaked out. She she had a very bad feeling. She said once he shot and it, it veered off, she just got this real clenching fear. Uh, she called it the essence of fear was in the air. So they sit there and they're waiting because they, they hear noises, but they can't pinpoint exactly where what is, right? Um, the wind had shifted, uh, but it was variable, right? So, you know, they still couldn't necessarily take off. They still had the distance to get to the plane, but also now that he's worried about their back trail in this bear. So at one point, the wind shifts and blows into their face, and they get this weird kind of funky smell. Um, they said it smelled like real bad B.O. with urine. And once they caught that smell, they, that wasn't a bear smell. You know what I mean? So they were like, they looked at each other, and then they were like, what if that's a hairy man? And that's when they both got even more freaked out. They, they God bless them, man. They, they sat there sharing stories they're they're watching the whole time this tree line but they're sharing stories oh remember my uncle's story you know when it was up on the cabin and yada yada and so they're they're literally they're they're getting themselves pumped up and freaked out over 
I, I don't know what possessed him, and they don't know what possessed him to share Harry Man stories in the midst of an encounter, right? Even though they haven't had a visual, that they're they're getting just really, really worked up. So Paul was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Let's get to the plane. You know, let's let's stop. Let's get to the plane because they said they sat there roughly an hour, like you know, discussing this, looking around, nothing." absolutely nothing heard nothing got that whiff of smell saw nothing right so they're like all right screw this so they start trucking to the plane well it was about uh 250 yards roughly to where the plane was at the edge of the at the edge of the muskeg in the water right paul said once they got within 50 yards of the plane he got this overwhelming sense of being watched Ramona said the same thing. They both felt it at the same time because they were almost shoulder to shoulder. Ramona was like a half a pace behind Paul and back behind his left shoulder as they're coming up on the plane. And all of a sudden, they just instinctually, they both turned at the same time and they see this thing just outside the tree line about maybe 10, 15 yards. And it stands up to full height. And with the willows and stuff with still green leaves and stuff on it they immediately saw this humanoid outline and instantly they it confirmed it was the hairy man right paul said his initial uh reflex was to put it down like he he said it, something in him was just like i should kill this thing right well he turns and as soon as he makes you know like lines up with it and shoulders the rifle immediately he gets this feeling like no, I can't do that you know it's we're not in danger I don't even know what this is so he you know that initial thought of I'm gonna kill it immediately fades away and so they stand there and since they're close to the plane they're they're feeling a little more comfortable checking it out seeing what the hell it's doing well as as they're squatted down next to each other whispering you know because they're it's looking back at them they're looking at him whispering to each other what what's it what what do you think it wants and so they're they're just going over speculation right because they're totally like whoa you know it's right over there well paul said in the midst of this all of a sudden it lets out this banshee like scream this horrific high-pitched kind of he said it reminded him of like a real sick yodel because it, it, it was like multiple octaves, super loud and real screechy, but it was this varying kind of yodel sound, right? And it, they were both immediately scared to their core. Ramona said that she immediately started pointing her pistol at it, right? And, and Paul's like, put it down, put it down. It's, it's standing there. It's just making noise, you know, calm down. And everything Ramona said in her was like, go, 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 get out of here, get out of here. And so she, you know, is telling Paul, honey, we need to get in the plane and, and, and get the hell out of here. So they slowly, because this thing is still, it stopped making the noise, but it's still standing back behind them. And so they, they make it back over the plane, and Paul's still watching it. It has not moved. It's just kind of, every once in a while, it kind of leans a little bit, he said, and was kind of like eyeballing, trying to figure him out, you know, uh, a real curious kind of vibe in the air. So he said they got into the plane and the wind was good as far as trying to take off. So he got Ramona in and he pushed off, fired up, and they taxied down and turned into the wind to take off. And he said he was setting his flaps and he was looking out the off to his left now uh, because they're taking off due south. He's looking out to his left and this thing is squatted down and it's still doing this number. And the plane's running and stuff. So it's just kind of observing them, right? So they take off. He says he, he gains altitude and then banks off to the right and circles around and comes back right towards this thing. And he's trying to keep an eye on it at elevation. He said he was at about a 1,000 feet as he's coming in. And he's, he's trying to look down to see if they could make it run. They wanted to see it run for whatever reason. I mean, they were safe in a plane, so why, you know, let's, let's see if we can see this thing moving. Well, sure enough, it took off running, but it was running right along the tree line. And there, he was trying, you know, there, of course, there's no traffic or anything, you know. But he's, you know, making sure there's no obstacles as he's turning, focusing on watching this thing. And he's slowly making a bank, turning back north. And they're watching this thing, and they kind of passed over it and came back over on top. And we're just off to the side of it, looking down off to the right. And he said this thing 
they were they were skirting they were moving at damn near uh i think it was uh, real close to 100 and something knots or something like that r roughly you know what i mean because uh, once they turned they had the tailwind and they were they were kind of booking along and they were passing it uh he said he couldn't for sure say oh it was running this fast or that fast but what he was saying was is it was moving to the point where it was almost it seemed like almost like it was keeping up with them almost until you know once once it, they got past it and everything he circled back once or twice seeing if they could find it again but it was it was gone um they continued on there was uh, no one was available at the lodge they couldn't stay there or whatever so they take off they fly back over towards Dillingham. They got some fuel. Uh, it was they had enough daylight uh, to fly back through. So what they decided to do is go up to Iliamna, Port Allsworth, or whatever, Allsworth. And so that's what they do. They they leave Dillingham to go up to Allsworth, and that's the extent of their their adventure as far as that that episode. Um, the, uh, and I asked, you guys are out there, how often have you come across something like that? And they said, one time, it was memorable, we will never search for it. Uh, Paul felt like they were being run off, not necessarily going to be attacked, which is fair enough. But I mean, let's be honest, it, on a on a trail in the trees, you're, you're caught. You, it's done, Dada. Um, but anyway, I want to thank them for sharing. Uh, they've been following various channels and whatnot and then they finally came across uh this channel a couple months ago and you know after watching some of the videos or whatever they they've reached out and i, I appreciate them sharing and being patient uh coordinating being able to talk about their experience um there's other people i will have on soon who will I express their experiences in their own words uh, again i give everyone the opportunity but i want to thank ramona and paul um I appreciate the invite to dinner. Next time I make it in Anchorage, I'll pre-plan and, and take you up on that offer. Uh, nothing like a good moose roast, for sure. But uh, I want to thank them. Thank you guys for joining me, and we will catch you on the next one.